Talking about the scapular region and superficial back, as we know that the scapulothoracic articulation is a functional joint, yet there is movement uh, in terms of different directions, and that is occurred uh, that occurs by different muscles. So now, once we know the muscles and their action, now let's take uh, a look at those movements which are actually available to at the scapulothoracic articulation. So we are going to take a look at those specific movements. We're also going to talk about the scapulohumeral rhythm, which is the association of of the movement between the scapulothoracic articulation and the glenohumeral joint. We're also going to talk about the uh, movements of the scapula which are associated with the movements that occur at the glenohumeral joint. So scapulothoracic articulation involves gliding of the scapula on the posterior aspect of the thorax or the rib cage where the ventral aspect of the scapula is the concave partner whereas the dorsal aspect of the thorac thoracic cage or the rib cage or the thorax is the convex partner. So subscapularis and strata syndrome are two very important muscles as we already discussed in the previous section which are responsible for stabilizing the scapula by giving it dynamic stability and keeping it in its place by keeping the scapula on the chest wall and preventing scapular winging. Now the enhanced mobility of the shoulder complex is provided by these two muscles because of them providing the stability and also there is also different type of movements which can occur at the scapulothoracic articulation. The movements which can occur are the elevation which is the upward movement of the scapula, depression which is the downward movement of the scapula, the protraction which is the anterior tail movement of the scapula and retraction which is the backward movement of the scapula. Then we have the upward rotation in which the inferior angle of the scapula moves upward and downward rotation when that inferior angles come back downward or it's to its neutral position and that is known as downward rotation. Now scapular tilting is actually sometimes also known as anterior and posterior tipping in which for example anterior tipping the superior angles moves anteriorly and posterior angles moves posteriorly and in posterior tipping and superior angle moves posteriorly and inferior angle moves anteriorly. Now talking about the uh, upward rotation of the scapula, to understand it we need to take a look at the inferior angle and we can also palpate this inferior angle and we can observe, analyze, uh, inspect and palpate it uh, for our uh, assessment of different patients or athletes and if this angle moves upward then it means that there is upward rotation which is occurring. So it is actually performed by the coupling of the upper trapezius, the lower trapezius and the serratus interior. Now talking about the shoulder complex, uh, when we say the glenohumeral joint, that is the joint between the glenoid cavity and the humerus. When we say scapulothoracic articulation, that is the functional joint between the scapula and the thoracic uh, cage or the rib cage. But when we talk about the shoulder complex, it consists of the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the scapulothoracic articulation and the glenohumeral joint. So three anatomical joints and one functional joint. So shoulder girdle is the link between the upper extremity and the trunk and it acts with elbow to position the hand in space, most dynamic mobile joint in the body if we talk about the whole complex and contains glenohumeral, acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular and scapulothoracic articulations and the muscular structures acting on them. So absence of bony constraint allows greater range of motion at the expense of stability provided by soft tissue. So dynamic stability is of great importance. Now, as we already mentioned that in shoulder complex we have the glenohumeral joint so the movements of the glenohumeral joint are uh, associated with the movements at the scapulothoracic articulation which arises the basics of the scapulohumeral rhythm. Now what is scapulohumeral rhythm? So scapulohumeral rhythm is the average ratio of the glenohumeral movement to the scapulothoracic movement which is in terms of 2 ratio 1. For every 2 degrees of movement at the glenohumeral joint, there is 1 degree of accompanied movement at the scapulothoracic articulation. Now, this ratio or this scapulohumeral rhythm describes movement relationship between the shoulder girdle or the scapula and the glenohumeral joint. Now, first 30 degree is pure sh shoulder joint motion whenever, for example, if you're talking about abduction, when we initiate the abduction or the elevation, the first 30 degree is pure shoulder joint motion. 
and then afterwards every two degree of shoulder flexion abduction after the first 30 degree causes one degree upward rotation of the scapula and uh, by the end or the by the uh, end of the elevation or the movement at the glenohumeral joint there is one ratio one movement of the scapular humor rhythm so overall this uh, 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 1 ratio 0, 2 ratio 1 and 1 ratio 1 if we add this and that we simplify it that the overall ratio is once again 2 ratio 1 uh, for the scapular, rhythm, scapular human rhythm in the uh, general aspect. Now if you talk about for example the elevation which is abduction or flexion with elevation uh, or abduction the arm requires or the glenohumeral joint requires synchronous upward rotation of the scapula and that is a part of the scapular humeral rhythm and that is clinically very important because if there is only abduction of the uh, glenohumeral joint and the upward movement of the humerus and the scapula does not move then eventually the joint uh, would move in such a way that the space between the acromion process and the uh, supi aspect of the humerus would actually start decreasing and then eventually lead to impingement of different structures such as subacromial impingement leading to impingement of supraspinatus and uh, so subacromial bursitis uh, leading to conditions such as subacromial bursitis as I already mentioned or the supraspinatus tendonitis which may eventually lead to a rotator cuff injury as well. But when there is normal upper rotation of this scapula then uh, in the proper scapulohumeral rhythm this uh, impingement does not occur because as there is upward movement of the humerus there is also upward movement of the scapula because of the upward rotation of the scapula. Now, as we already discussed that there is an association between the movements of the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint and the shoulder girdle or the scapulothoracic articulation. So with flexion at the glenohumeral joint, there is upward rotation at the scapula, but there is also protraction at the scapula. With extension at the glenohumeral joint, there is downward rotation of the scapula accompanied with retraction of the scapula. With hyperextension beyond the zero degree extension, uh, with hyperextension of the glenohumeral joint, there is uh, scapular tilting in which the uh, inferior aspect or the inferior angle tilts posteriorly and the superior angle of the scapula tilts anteriorly. In abduction of the glenohumeral joint, there is upper rotation of the scapula and in adduction there is opposite which is the down rotation of the scapula. When we talk about the lateral rotation or the external rotation there is retraction of the scapula and when we talk about the medial rotation or the internal rotation there is protraction of the scapula. Moreover talking about the horizontal abduction in horizontal abduction uh, there is a uh, Retraction of the scapula because you are moving the arms outwards and in the horizontal adduction there is protraction of the scapula. So I hope now you uh, understood the association uh, between the scapulothoracic and glenohumeral articulation and the different movements and which movement at the glenohumeral joint is uh, associated or accompanied by the movement, uh, which movement at the scapulothoracic articulation and I hope you also understood the different movements possible at the scapulothoracic articulation and that was uh, pretty much uh, about this section and I hope you learned something new out of it and keep on watching scalia.com for more lectures like this. Uh, thank you very much.